Looking to maximize the sale of your practice? Join me to learn the top five reasons your practice won't sell. My name is Tyler Russell. I'm the general manager for the dental practice brokers division for Henry Schein Dental. I live up here north of Boston. I've been in dentistry now for just shy of 20 years. I've spent the better part of a decade helping doctors transition their practice and realizing their transition and, re and retirement dreams. I spend most of my day working with, with our team across the United States, helping our doctors understand and realize their personal, professional, and financial goals as they go into their transition. Over the last 20 years, I've helped hundreds of doctors, again, hundreds, as they look to transition their practice and have a successful retirement or find the best DSO partner for their practice. A little bit about Henry Scheid Dental Practice Transitions. We have 50 brokers across the United States covering all 50 states. Again, our ultimate goal is to help our doctors realize their personal, professional, and financial goals. How do we do that? We spend a lot of our time sitting kneecap to kneecap with our doctors, understanding their needs, doing our consulting work in advance of a transition, typically doing a practice valuation. A practice valuation is ultimately a treatment plan for your, for your practice as you look towards retirement. But it's not always retirement. As you guys know, the DSO space and dentistry has exploded. So what does that mean? Different services, different buyers, different approach. You need an expert, you need the expertise, and those that have the at-bats to make sure it's successful. We also work in, in commercial real estate, help buyers as they look to find a practice, looking at different partnership needs, uh, of course, as you look towards lending, um, you know, scaling a practice using debt, very special, requires different needs, different expertise. We're here to help. So let's dig in. Number five, why won't you sell your practice? Well, that could be you. When you look at your practice, you've been in your career 20, 25, 30 years. You've done certain things in your practice. You've made your practice a high-end fee-for-service practice. You're what I might call a super GP or a super general dentist, right? These are all great things. But when you have very limited insurance in your practice, your patients identify with you, and that could be a problem for a buyer. So ask yourself, if you're the average buyer and you're stepping into this practice, can you handle the workload? Can you handle the type of patient base that is there? But more importantly, think about this from a clinical perspective. If you've branched out and you specialize and you're looking at sleep apnea cases, you're actually placing implants, not just restoring, but placing implants could be a problem. Also, look at fixed brackets if you're doing orthodontic work, not a line of therapy, but fixed brackets in your practice. Again, these are all great things from a clinical perspective, but could really narrow the buyer pool for your practice and therefore limit your total enterprise value as you look to sell your practice. But here's what I would say to you. Do your homework, do your homework, do your homework. As you look to sell your practice, consult your financial advisor, consult your dental practice broker, and of course, your CPA. These are the experts that need to come along the journey with you to make sure you're, you're ready, you're prepared, and you're committed to the process, and they're going to tee you up for a successful exit, whether you're choosing to sell your, your practice to a, a, another doctor, i.e. a doc-doc deals, I like to call it, or to a DSO. As you think about this, are your expectations realistic? These experts can help you. Number four, age of the equipment, technology, and also for the, the facility. I get it. You've been at this location for the last 30 years. It might be unlikely that you can expand and you know, break down walls and things like that, but walk around your practice. Think about this just like you're the buyer. What do they see? So some things to think about. Avoid clutter. Put some fresh paint on the walls. If you've got carpets in the operatories, get it out. Look at new flooring. Is the, the chemicals in, that you're using to be OSHA compliant in your operatories, is it breaking down the laminate countertops that you have? Might be time to update. Now let's talk about equipment and technology. Buyers today are used to working and practicing clinically with a certain standard of care. Not saying that you're not practicing standard of care, but if you're not digital, it is very much, you are very much out of, out of touch with reality and you're divorced from the fact that buyers are expecting digital technology. So look at your practice and think about this. 
Are you using a modern dental practice management software? Do you have digital x-ray? Digital cameras? Two-dimensional two pano? And certainly a modern sterilization center. Look around your practice. And if you haven't made these investments, take a look and, and think about making the investment. Number three, landlord and property issues. Have your attorney and your dental practice broker take a look at your lease. Why do they need to do that? Well, if your landlord is a corporate landlord or a mom and pop, big difference in timing and potentially fees. Let's dig in. If you have a corporate landlord, most corporate landlords are going to ask you to work with their attorney, which is going to cost you a couple thousand dollars because they want you to pay for their legal bills because ultimately you're asking for them to enter into a new lease with the new buyer. So it's a very reasonable request. But if you're looking to sell your practice in 30 to 45 days, their process could take 60 to 90 days. Something you need to think about and dig in. And then the mom and pop landlord. Is your landlord the spouse or the doctor, potentially the next of kin of the doctor that you bought the practice from? Is it going to be so easy to rewrite a lease with them if you're selling your practice to, to a DSO? Again, something to think about. But other potentially more catastrophic questions, is your lease even assignable? Is there a redevelopment clause in, in the lease? Again, potential deal killers, talk to your attorney. Let's talk about an opportunity for a second. If, if you have a space and the adjacent space next door is available, consider taking it, especially if you have a limited, limited amount of square footage, two, three operatories. If you can potentially expand into, into four, five, maybe even six, very valuable to, to the next buyer. Let's talk about self-ownership for a second. If you or your spouse own the commercial real estate where your practice is housed, that's fantastic. A lot of buyers want to take over and eventually be paying themselves versus paying a third-party landlord. All great things, but there are some valuation implications here. Is your lease a market lease? Do you understand the comps that are, that are local to your area from a medical perspective? So look at the comps. Do you understand what a triple net versus gross or a modified gross lease is? And where do you find those expenses on your profit loss statement? Understanding the cost implications for your lease now is very important as you look to value the practice and ultimately sell the practice. If there are expenses that are not in your P&L now, could limit cash flow. Looking at the appraisal, if you want to sell the place, do an appraisal now, dig in now, so you can understand that if the if the if the real estate, just like your practice, is an important part of your retirement planning, dig in now. The big takeaway here: talk to your dental practice broker, talk to your to your attorney now, because these are big things that you can control. You can control in advance because these might take months, if not years, to rectify, depending on your situation. Number two, associate contract issues. I'd like to draw your attention to the picture on, on my screen, which says temporary insanity too. Listen, I understand it. You've been in the marketplace. You've been working very hard chair side for the last 30 years. So you're, you get tired. You feel like you paid your dues. You want to play golf. You want to go fishing. Maybe you're like me and you want to spend the afternoon skiing. Well, if you've got a book of business and you've got patience to see, you might not be able to take that time. But think before you act. If you hire an associate and you don't have them on a contract, this could be a major deal killer and, and cost you potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars as you look to sell your practice. So like the previous slide, hire an attorney, have them draft a realistic contract. And when I say hire an attorney, don't hire your, your, your cousin, your uncle, hire a dental specific attorney that understand the rules of the road and what associate doctors are going to be looking for. So these are real life considerations, but specifically dig into your, to having an enforceable restrictive covenant and a non-solicitation of patients. Again, I can't stress enough having your attorney work with you with a realistic associate contract as you look to add an associate. Adding an associate is a very beneficial thing, but don't fall into the, 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 the temporary insanity and hire somebody because you think they're a good guy with a handshake. Just don't do it. Finally, declining revenue. In many cases, there is a very solid reason why your practice is in decline. You've taken a day off. You unfortunately were sick. 
had to take some time out of the practice. These are all legitimate reasons, probably more than more legitimate than just having general softness in your business, but the, but the decline can be quite challenging as you look to value and ultimately sell your practice. Why is that? You might have very real impairment to value due to limited cash flow as you go to sell your practice. Why is that? The buyers, of course, for the most part, have a loan that they that they need to pay in order to afford the value of your practice. Limited cash flow impairs value, and it's going to limit the buyer pool for your practice, and therefore what you're going to take home when you sell your practice. Depending on the severity, could be deal killing. Might also turn your practice into a, a, a merger versus a full sale, which has implications for your patients and also for your team. Again, it's going to limit the buyer pool, and it's also going to limit financing options for your buyer. Not saying your practice won't get sold. Most practices, ultimately, we, we can and will sell successfully, but it might also require you to participate a little bit. What does that mean? Stellar financing. You might have to become the bank because of the, because of the situation in your practice, i.e. the decline in revenue. You might also have to participate with an earnout, potentially a holdback. All things that are very commonplace in the deals that we do, but if we can prevent that from happening to you, all the better. So how do you avoid it? Well, simply put, avoid reduction of clinical days in your practice. So if you if you are going to take some time off, hire that associate. But before you hire the associate, make sure that you hire the right attorney to draft the right document to protect yourself. And lastly, and I hate to go this go down this road, please have your affairs in order. God forbid something were to happen to you and you were to die or to become disabled. Hopefully, and ideally unlikely, right? But if something were to happen to you, that's when you're going to have real decline of revenue and it's going to become very challenging to, 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 to ultimately sell your practice. So if you've done the work up front, you have a legitimate valuation in place, you have a relationship with a dental practice broker, these are things that we can, there are things that we can help you do to move the practice faster and ultimately help you and your family. I appreciate the opportunity. If you'd like to learn more, please click on the link below.